Hey, everybody. It is March 9, 2023, and welcome to TAM Integration. We uh, offer education and support for people who are deeply committed to healing and growth and transformation and who often use psychedelics to do that. Uh, one of the things we like to do is have a guest once a month, and we talk about various topics in uh, integration and psychedelic culture and science and have a little open discussion about them as well. I am ever so happy that uh, Bryce interacted with me on Twitter or Instagram and 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 then accepted my invitation to do this on, on very, very short notice. I have been watching Bryce from afar for many, many years. We haven't gotten that many chances to interact. Um, I, I am thinking back to uh, the 2020 pandemic bicycle day Zoom Zoom rooms. I believe we we got to play in there a bit together. Uh, but Bryce uh, Montgomery is a conduit for information with a passion for amplifying ideas, stories, and missions within the psychedelic industry. For 11 years, Bryce built a career as a leader of communications and marketing initiatives for Maps, and you've now left Maps and is looking for work. So everybody out there in YouTube land uh, better recognize who this is. It's a, you could probably get them at a steal. And I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, aren't you the person who came up with the idea that difficult experiences aren't necessarily bad trips? Is that you? I, I wish I could take credit for that. Um, and if no one else has claimed credit, why not? Sure, it was me. Um, but um, I learned that from the Zendo Project, um, right. volunteering with them and uh, helping with their communications and marketing. Sure, sure, you worked with Zendo as well. And so we're going to talk today about ineffability, about the thing, explaining the things that can't be explained, doing the things that can't be done and winning the things that can't be won. And why did you pick this topic? What made it, what was interesting for you about the idea of ineffability and wanting to describe it and chat about it? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity and introduction. Um, I pitched uh, three ideas uh, for full transparency, but I'm actually mm -hmm. glad it's this one because I feel like this is the one that I have the most passion about, especially within um, my career in the psychedelic industry. Mm -hmm. In the past, I often would say things like, I was reviewing some old journal entries uh, to prepare for this, and one of them said something to the effect of like, there's no way to describe like the level of my passion or um, I wish there was a word for this. And um, following that, um, while I couldn't find the journal entry for it, I, I know that during another psychedelic experience, I had the intention um, to push beyond ineffability. These experiences that I've had that have felt transcendent or mystical, uh, those are, you know, good anchor words for others to kind of get like a taste of it, but to fully like transmute the experience, I realized that it's not enough to just say like, it's ineffable or like, it's amazing. I feel like as the psychedelic movement grows, we owe it to ourselves to try to come up with the words um, that can help contextualize it for people that may be psychedelic naive or are proponents of uh, the psychedelic stigma. And as more and more people have opportunities to potentially receive psychedelic therapy um, in the coming years, decades, forever, uh, I think there needs to be more of a conversation, a dialogue about what these psychedelic effects are like. Like how long can the kind of mainstream depiction of like the walls are melting, like go on or like rainbow and tie dye. Um, I think as humans with the ability to speak, um, it's a fun challenge to pursue. Um, I think it can help shift the narrative about psychedelics in um, more honest and accurate artistic ways. Um, you know, I want to be clear that like the ineffability of psychedelics is not just for like the good stuff, like it's the most mind blowing experience I've ever had, or, um, you know, I felt 
total oneness, I think also acknowledging the difficult side is also important. Like the difficult psychedelic experiences can also be quote ineffable. Um, and I think being able to highlight both the risks and benefits with um, more of a framework um, for discussing them is very important going forward. Right, because that's where we also get negative tropes because for me melting walls and tie-dyed hippies like that's 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 good stuff um but what you're making me think of are the ideas of you know the acid head that jumps off a roof or something thinking they could fly Mm -hmm. you know are are not helpful really not except in very very few cases not particularly true and points to an inner experience that is um, could be described better. Absolutely, um, and the the kind of uh, negative depictions, like I'm reminded of, like dare campaigns or um, the you know hippie jumping off a roof example you shared. Like this is your brain on drugs. It's a fried egg. Like mm-hmm. as misleading or inaccurate as that is, that's that's like a strong concepts uh, for people to attach to and it worked for many people um some people eventually you know did their own uh, pursuit of research and education and uh no longer thinks that or the other one i don't know if you've heard this one but like you'll take lsd and you'll think you're a glass of orange juice like the orange juice there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of these like tropes that are like anchored and embedded and i think we need a proliferation of similar um depictions for both good and bad so that it's not the same thing over and over again. Um, we have an opportunity to really progress and uh, advance the movement. Well, even in modern culture, the, the psychedelic user is still really easy to make fun of. And there are all of these tropes of like the neo shaman festival goer that speaks in psychedelic word salad and doesn't have any critical thinking and is perhaps um, disingenuous in their relationships. Totally, yeah. Um, I think we need more character archetypes uh, for people Mm -hmm. to latch on to. And a lot of the kind of bias that may exist uh, at this time, I think can slowly erode. Similar to how like media coverage of psychedelics helps people understand that like oh, there's actually something to this. Like last time I read an article was in the 70s or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And as individuals within the community, we are our own, we're not mainstream media, but we're like microdose media. My visionary, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, And we we can tell our friends, our family, strangers um, about psychedelics, about our experiences, about the benefits um, because we have a voice and we can share it. Like, small right. rippling effect like they might tell someone else and then it spirals in a good way right in in ways that were once unheard of you know yeah, i think absolutely. that you know i showed my mom my instagram reach and she was shocked you know that 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 i had access to the, the, that many people um you know it's not a huge account all things considered but it's kind it's certainly more than she would have had access to. Mm-hmm. That's so sweet. I hope she's tremendously proud of you. Um. <laughs> Give or take. Um, uh, but on, it, and this is, and, and speaking of mainstream media, I don't necessarily watch a lot of John Oliver necessarily. Like I'm not a John Oliver head, but you know, 1,700 people sent me his 20 minutes on on psychedelic use. And my favorite part of it was when he deconstructed those negative narratives that were untrue and pointing out to people that, remember, remember when they told you this and you believed it in 1989? Like they were lying. And mm-hmm. that's kind of a watershed moment in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And the Netflix uh, documentary series based on Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind is another one. Mm -hmm. Definitely not in like the comedic, uh, humorous container that um, last week's night of John Oliver has, but 
I think the John Oliver one's a great example because whereas like the How to Change Your Mind documentary series on Netflix was just high quality, great interviews, great quotes, like just mm -hmm. top tier filmmaking. I think other avenues like humor, like maybe one of the best ways to describe your experience is like poking fun at it or like add, adding like a mm -hmm. comedic allegory to it. Similar to like, you know, some people may not be the most eloquent with their voice or in their writing, but they're a tremendous artist in terms of painting or mm -hmm. uh, making music. Um, and I was thinking earlier about how like jam bands like Grateful Dead or Fisher or whatever are like ways to communicate, you know, as aspects of the psychedelic experience to mm -hmm. people who, are diehard and will follow them around because they kind of want to keep that going or for people who have never had a psychedelic experience and are like, I love this so much. It's like, have you heard about psychedelics? Not to say it's uh, fully equatable, but um, I'm just impressed by all the different avenues that people can express themselves and mm -hmm. describe their experiences in unique ways. Well, the nice thing about music is you feel it, you know, and, and li emotionally you feel it but literally like there's vibrations mm -hmm. in music. I once, I don't know if you know the band Ohm Vibrator, Ohm. It's deeply, it's kind of doom metal um, mm -hmm. and it's deeply bass driven. You know, there's kind of this gnome wizard that plays the bass and then there's Emilamus on drums and, and, and it shakes your body and it shakes stuff loose but also being able to feel it emotionally, feel it somatically uh, is so much really about what the psychedelic experience is all about. Only some of it happens with your rational mind. It, it's ineffable because it's in some ways, because it's hitting parts of you that are, have nothing to do with your rationality. Mm. Yeah. I love that phrasing uh, very much. Uh, and did you, have you read Rick Rubin's new book? No, but um, I saw it mentioned in, I think, your newsletter, and I added it to all the relevant things that I keep track of, uh, things of note, um, which unfortunately I often don't pursue. I, I'm obsessed with bookmarking things and never going back to them, but I'm aware of it now, so thank you for that. And I'm aware, uh, Rick Rubin, and I'm a fan. I've watched all of his interviews, but I didn't know he had a book until you mentioned it. One of the quotes from the book was, the artist's job is to convey emotion that the artist has felt. Hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do too. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier about like kind of like poking fun at things. And I'm curious how like one of my other kind of like, I don't know, topics for suggestion is just like memes is another form of like, you know, artwork, music. Mm -hmm. me I feel like, you know, the, the humor um, kind of uh, pipeline uh, memes are included within that. And, um, I, I often see memes where I'm like, that's so relatable because I've had a similar experience, but for people who have not, now they have one other touch point um, to consider um, as they think about psychedelics, whether they ever choose to do them or not, or they're a therapist pursuing the field, but they're not necessarily uh, pursuing their own um, psychedelic experiences. But I think just having more and more um, context um, yeah. and, I, I'm thinking about like my own psychedelic experiences and how my like narrative about them has changed over time. It was the same experience I had, you know, however many years ago, but at, the more and more I talk about it, the stronger depiction of it um, emerges. And uh, how so? Like, you know, one example that comes to mind, I'm very fortunate and privileged to have had a, a number of psychedelic experiences uh, in my human existence. Uh, but it, it was uh, an experience where I was on LSD and MDMA simultaneously, and also nitrous oxide intermittently. And the first way I would describe it was perfect. Just like, how was it? It was like, oh, it was perfect. Uh, the next phase of it became something to the effect of like, it was like the feeling of perfection forever or looping infinitely. And that, that all those uh, um, descriptions are true, but more and more I described like 
the emotional aspect, the uh, sensory aspect, the inner mind visual aspect. So like, it was like pillars of creation, you know, pulsating throughout my entire uh, vision in like sorbet, yellow and orange landscape, um, feeling connected to my partner, feeling loved, accepted, um, like inspired, safe, tender, held. Um, it was a very spiritual experience for me. And then my like psychedelic uh, mindset, like when I say like felt like forever, it, it felt like forever. I'm like, oh, this is where, this is my reality now. Just this feeling of bliss and perfection for eternity. I'm like, this is pretty nice. Eventually, you know, psychedelics uh, don't last forever. Thankfully I came out of it, but I didn't have that context before. I knew, I, re I remember all those aspects, but for some reason I didn't feel called to share them. And even though that experience is subjective and like can't be replicated necessarily, it at least kind of gives a framework for, you know, what may be possible. And mm -hmm. I, my psychedelic career um, kind of blossomed from starting with Arrowhead uh, experience vaults, like trip reports, where before I ever did psychedelics, I wanted to learn about them. And the only way I knew how at the time was reading what other people thought of it. And I think like the Arrowhead experience vaults, just people writing about their experience and like noting the time it took, like the, you know, here's what happened during the onset, here's what happened during the peak at, at this time, who they were with, et cetera. And like some beautiful, beautiful writing, but, after that, I was like, well, there must be science to describe, you know, everything that happened. And that's how I found maps um, and began my psychedelic career in that way. Um, and I think that it's a great practice, even if anyone never reads it besides yourself, uh, but just to practice the writing um, element of it, or just to read other ones and get inspired, um, or just share the Arrowhead experience well, link with everybody. Um, and it's not the only uh, resource for, um, people communicating their psychedelic experience, but it's definitely one of the most uh, thorough, dense, and uh, mm. inspiring. And it is a tricky thing because it requires a certain facility and sophistication of the use of the English language. Uh, oh, yeah. And it, it is almost, you know, I run integration circles every week and you can tell like who's good at English you know and you can also see people's ability to describe their experience grow over time it's almost as if you were learning about anything like I have a I, I, I have a toddler and I live in a small town that has car shows on Main Street once or twice a year and so we go to car shows on Main Street and I'm not a car guy, but my three-year-old wants to talk to the car guys, right? And so when you're there, like there'll be a couple of car guys that'll be like, oh yeah, and the carburetor, like they've got, la they've got a language about the carburetor and like the style of paint and like the whole thing. And they can have a conversation and keep the ball in the air using jargon that if you're not initiated, it makes no sense. And I would have to like hang out for a long time to be able to have a conversation with these guys in their own language. And I think the same is true for psychonauts. They, they, they develop, you know, perfect might have been the only word you had for it for a while. Um, and, and if also, I may add, prompting, yeah, people prompting me, they're, they're basically being like, well, what was perfect about it? Like mm -hmm. I, you know, at a time I didn't really feel like I needed to unpack it, but they're like, all right, yeah. well, and also I recently started, uh, I took one of the surveys about like psychedelics and relationship or psychedelics and love. And like, that was another thing that strengthened um, mm -hmm. my understanding of that experience because they were asking all these different prompts and questions. And I feel like if we have our own set of prompts to reference for describing our own experiences or to inquire about others' experiences, psychedelic or otherwise, it's just great to learn about people and help them understand mm -hmm. themselves better, their experiences, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to flag that like others helped me get to that understanding of um, the beautiful complexity of it. 
And then also we might not even have the emotional intelligence to know what happened. Yeah. I, I had an experience in 1993 that I didn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to unpack until like last year. Um, can I share this moment? Please. Yeah, we've got, I think we've got plenty of time and I'm enjoying this and uh, yeah. happy to follow your lead. So, you know, I was just, I, I was 15 on LSD, you know, at my friend, I had a friend who, you know, I rolled with, like, like we were tight and then he made some friends and we were at their house because their parents were out of town. And it was a fairly intense, you know, it was intense and weird and strange in a lot of ways. And, you know, what, we could talk more about that, but that's not the point. Um, at some point we were outside in the backyard and we were all standing very close together and we were having a good time looking up at the sky and then looking back down at the ground, looking back up at the sky at the stars and looking back down. And it was like, we were like, Whoa, you know, um, like you do. And I remember there were a couple of times when I shouted out, Oh my God, where are we? And I remember them getting very concerned and being like, Dan, you're okay. You're, you're in, you're in Brett's backyard. Like, it's okay. You're on earth. You're in the backyard. And I, sh I just shut down. Like I just sort of like went inward and it didn't occur to me. Cause also I didn't think about this. This was like a memory. I, I didn't, it's not like I thought about this every day trying to figure out what happened to me, but I realized that like, I knew I was in Brett's backyard. It was a much bigger ineffable. Where are we? It was this cosmic, where are we? And they weren't meeting me on that level. They were worried that I was like out of line or like not okay, but I was okay. I just wanted to have like a bigger conversation and I felt embarrassed and shamed and I shut down and I didn't have the emotional intelligence to like, be like, to be like, don't shame me. I know I'm good. Let's talk about our place in the cosmos. And so I just, right. you know, 15 year old kid shut down and we don't always know what we don't know until much later. Yeah. Um, I'm really uh, delighted you share that. And also I'm really glad that you were able to unpack that and um, like reflect on it. And I think that's a useful practice for um, anybody in all aspects of our life, but we'll just keep a focus on psychedelics. But uh, mm -hmm. in the case of, uh, you know, anyone who's here right now or watching, I think that, you know, finding, you know, the most memorable psychedelic experience or the most uh, transformational experience and then developing it further. Um, it reminds me of like uh, patch notes in tech software, uh, like a, a new update where it's like, okay, here's what's changed. Um, mm. And uh, I also think like the least memorable psychedelic experience uh, is worth developing. Like maybe eventually they could all be of equal weight and it may be, you know, seen as a potentially futile gesture, but if you are passionate about your own growth and healing, um, there's more to your story that can be developed um, as you reflect on it through like, you know, integration, as you mentioned, or regular therapy, journaling, mm -hmm. creative arts, uh, or just talking with friends. Like, um, you know, any one word uh, start, I think is uh, excellent, um, you know, beginning, like my perfect one that developed into you know, smaller than, you know, maybe I could write, you know, an essay about it now. Um, and I think that's a, a fun practice, like, okay, well, last time I, you know, had a psilocybin experience, what's one word that can contextualize it to the best of my ability? What's the log line, like the one sentence quick summary, the elevator pitch for the experience? And then like, what's right, the, the little heading on Arrowhead? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah, like, like a, kind of just natural progression that just kind of gets bigger and bigger um so yeah i, I encourage anyone um to follow that same path All right and you know as you're saying that it's making me just kind of recognizing the importance of other stories that it's almost like it's like one of those Western movies where everybody has like a piece of the treasure map. Mm. And it's like, yeah. you, you tell your story and it's like, Oh, 
right. Like that happened to me. Like I did. I didn't realize, I didn't know how to think about it until you just said it. And I was like, Oh, it's kind of like that because there's a collective experience even in our singular experiences. Yeah. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because it's similar to how when people mention their psychedelic experience and it reminds you of your own, like you mentioning that kind of um, framework or approach reminded me of, you know, something similar where, like, where I was watching some show or movie with friends and some wild thing happened in the mirror. And I'm like, Oh, I had a DMT experience like that. And like, I knew that when I um, was experiencing DMT while looking in the mirror, my face kind of transformed into hundreds of faces I didn't recognize. Um, and this wasn't exactly what I saw in whatever visual media and whether it was a movie or a uh, show, but bringing that up because I was reminded through um, some other kind of visual reference had um, a catalyzing effect because my friends were like, really, what was it like? Or like, what are the faces or how long did it last? You know, I'm like, oh, right. I forgot. I hadn't really thought about that uh, that much. So mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad you brought up like the community element, um, whether it's uh, people that have had experiences that remind you of your own, like, oh yeah, like that happened to me too. Like it kind of normalizes it. Like if people be like, I had this really weird experience where I felt connected to everybody. I don't know. I feel like a little weird about mm -hmm. it. It's like, no, me too. Or um, and then, you know, people chiming in further. Um, so yeah, I think the kind of community elements um, great. And we are, we all have stories to tell. Um, and the yeah. psychedelic ones are especially interesting because they're more niche than, oh, you drove to work. A lot of people have done that, but not everyone has done psychedelics. And the more we talk about and it. And driven to work. People, <laughs> yeah um so yeah i think that there's uh a lot of opportunity um for psych psychonauts to strengthen each other's uh, awareness stories etc but also to kind of bring people in um in a compelling way yeah. and relatable way perhaps um as time goes on i've also been really encouraging of people to talk to their old people Right. Like it's one thing to talk to other psychonauts out in the world, but sometimes we get folks popping in to circle that haven't had anybody to talk to about their experiences for like 30 years, mm. like 56 year old guys who maybe break down into tears because, you know, things are, things are moving and, and they, they finally get to express something that was up for them. And it's almost like, I, I almost think about it like, a reverse amends like in the 12-step program where you're like oh something terrible happened i gotta say i'm sorry about it or whatever where you know what if you were to reach out to those people who were there back then in 1987 1993 and be like remember that time like let's can we unpack that now through the lens of our experience like how did the integration unfold over a decade yeah, and it makes me think like, I don't know how long, like I'm definitely uh, well aware of psychedelic integration, but like personally, I'm realizing that I don't know how long like that concept or like, you know, those two words paired together to help process and uh, integrate, you know, experiences has been around like, you know, the eight Six seven, years? The right, I mean, it's, it's not a long time. Um, so there's all these new concepts and tools and the internet's uh, done, you know, wonders for, um, you know, further proliferation of um, stories and education and research, et cetera. Um, and there's, and as you mentioned, like there's definitely these pockets of time where so many people were quote, turned on uh, to psychedelics. Like I think about the sixties, et cetera. And I have such a uh, adoration for the psychedelic elders that are currently participating. And I think there's a lot of psychedelic elders that don't know that they are psychedelic elders. They don't know mm -hmm. that they are revered or respected or um, others have a deep, um, desire to learn from them and connect with them um, and also to uh, share with them like I'm reminded of a clip I saw I think on YouTube yesterday where Steven Spielberg was talking about how much he learns from young filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like the kind of mutual um, sharing of information stories education um, is beneficial for everybody yeah absolutely and I'm also thinking about like, you know, diversifying like the audience, like 
how, how would I have explained that that like kind of perfect experience to a five year old like the subreddit like explain it like I'm five comes to mind or mm -hmm. uh, to a family member and I think these are kind of good exercises because that may come up like you may you know by chance tell like a sibling or something that you had a psycho experience they might tell your parents and you don't want them to know and they're like hey I heard you did psychedelics and you're like oh actually um here is the full story um that i've been developing and strengthening over time that uh may land well um with perhaps some muted uh phrasing or omissions um not to hide it but just to kind of make them understand it like if you're like hey parents like i know you're really into music like well here's what music did to me on psychedelics or um kind of making it more relatable like knowing your audience i think is important but mm -hmm. The story you tell yourself, I think, is uh, the most important because that's the one that kind of branches out uh, for others to uh, latch on to or feel inspired by. Right. And moving from, because the one of the things you mentioned that, that I think is really important is moving from a place of not wanting people to know, mm. you know, right? Yeah. Because like if, if my parents, aka authority, you know, find out then I'm in trouble in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully through people who are brave enough and have the ability in some way socially to share their stories without repercussions creates normalization where it's okay to. Yeah. Um, and I'm like reminded of my own personal experience because I've had both wins and fails of like, sharing my psychedelic experience with family members and other things like that and i am glad that you know a challenge of like being like hey i work for maps like it's a really cool thing here's the brochure you know at one point was like you know met with um you know heavy resistance um and fear and shame and all sorts of things but that didn't stop me and i'm so delighted that like i didn't allow that to get in the way and mm -hmm. I can see, I understand how other people might share something and then, you know, they have that kind of um, forced upon shame experience and they might decide they should never do that again. Like that was so painful. Like why would, but if you believe enough in uh, your authenticity, the power of the experience, I think you owe it to yourself to continue um, building that narrative and sharing it further. Um, I took a few notes during one of your earlier things, if I may just revisit them briefly. Um, uh, the the integration element that you mentioned, uh, it reminds me of the, like when you wake up from a dream, if you don't like write it down, like right away, you might forget it. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say like that's the essence of psychedelic integration, but like that's one way to kind of encourage people to try to process or explain to themselves or log their experience like as soon as you can you know for the benefits of integration or for the education connection etc um and uh i like what you were talking about like you know different languages and words and i'm reminded of like there's other cultures where they're like oh like what's the english word for this phrase in russian or some other language like oh well, we don't have that word or mm -hmm. like um i recently saw a meme where it was like two different kinds of spatula like one was like the stirring one and the other one is like oh well in germany you know this one's called this and like which basically translates to something like that and i'm realizing there might be different phrasing uh that can be applied um or like modeled based on other languages like in english we don't have a word for blank but you know some other um language or native speaker might be like oh right well that's obviously you know, whatever that, uh, right uh, because you might your friends might know the difference between like blazing and melting mm -hmm. yeah you know various kinds of psych you know the you know the come up and the peak and various languaging for blasting off and melting down and mm -hmm. you know the k-hole and the you know all of these these varieties of psychedelic experience it's not just one. It's not just like one thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, when you're talking about like the car jargon and like having to kind of like, you know, embed yourself to like become more familiar. I was also reminded of like, thank goodness urban dictionary exists, you know, not necessarily for psychedelics. I'm sure there's plenty of psychedelic content on there, but these kind of like external um, 
guidelines or right. references I think are really useful. Um, and when I was in high school, we had to take a foreign language like Spanish or sign language, but I wish that like alternative languages that aren't traditional were offered like music as a language or coding as a language. And like, yeah. I'm realizing now that there might be a psychedelic language um, that uh, could be applied and um, tangentially I'm reminded of like xenolinguistics and Diana Slattery's, um, you know, uh, expertise in that uh, topic and just this kind I'm of I'm like, so bummed her, her Guild of Xenolinguistics website is down. I used to, I oh, love that. I, I don't know if, if I've ever been there, it must've been a long time ago. Hopefully the Wayback Machine has it. Mm. If not, what a tragedy. Well, the thing is, I was hoping that one day I was going to get into it, into the guild. Oh. Because I do have my own little language, but that's that's not the topic of now. Um, what, what you reminded me of is that there was one time I was on psychedelics and that's all, all the stories. And a friend of mine and I were in Vermont in the, and we were just kind of like, running around in the snow and we had been skiing and we we're like in the snow and he's like this snow is so much different than the snow we were skiing on and i was like oh that's why eskimos have 40 words for it because mm. the snow because the snow was it was different snow mm -hmm. that's yeah. a great example um and like even just like to prepare for uh, this conversation like this is not my thesis statement or anything to be very clear i'm not not necessarily an expert but i am you're being graded on this yeah um i think that like you know the, the sources are great you know references like you know just looking to see like what are the other words that may describe ineffable or ineffability or mm -hmm. um you know what is the root word for it because like maybe that'll help you understand it better um so i think that like the kind of like 40 different words for you know different kind of snow or skiing or whatever um is a great example of that like maybe there's a different word about like you know melting as the example you used earlier like um if you did perhaps choose one word to describe an experience in the past what's a perhaps similar word um maybe put them all together in a sentence um and i'm also reminded of like non-language things like um movement like i was trying to think of like well how could ineffable experiences be described without words necessarily like uh familiar with like glossolalia like where you're kind of just like speaking in tongues or people that kind of i'm doing it right now gestate when they they speak um like i can't describe the experience but it was kind of like a you know just just any sort of like movement you're like okay yeah like a, a rapid like you know pounding pulsating experience or um just like adding adding like extra expression to your expression um just makes it even more um fully embodied um and i think it's good release like mm -hmm. as i you're like oh my god the whole world expanded like i feel myself opening up like you know when i when i do this motion um and i think that uh there's all sorts of uh different avenues or just like a sound is like a, a buzzing feeling like people know people can understand that because you just made the sound but like if you're describing it as like a physical sensation or like you know my you know sense of smell was buzzing you're like oh, wow what i'd love to learn more about that um, which is not an experience i've had it's just kind of a freestyle example but uh yeah i think there's like a lot of different or like touch like you're like just give me your hand and like just like squeeze it and I'm like okay yeah it was like this it was this but it was like my brain or it was my consciousness or it was my understanding of reality um gosh i love talking about psychedelics <laughs> those those 30 second long hugs followed by deep eye gazing oh yeah please but as far as you made me think with the hands because these are two different things and then we were all right there it's totally different then and then we were all right there yeah, pointing far away like it's we're all together close within as opposed to like oh yeah we're you know far out like that and, but you could um, use what i mean is you could use the same english words yeah and it would mean something different exactly here mm -hmm. here right yeah i think i think that's a, a great uh example um and it feels like a gift to be able to like 
my understanding of the topic, like I'm learning quite a bit um, just through uh, talking. And I also appreciate some of the stuff I see in chat. Like I just took a note of a dictionary of obscure sorrows. I'm not familiar with it, but like, I would love to see more. Um, Do you remember Sniglets? No. So when I think when Dennis Miller's early career, he invented Sniglets. So and the they were they were made up words. Up What's that? Is that the comedian that used to host Weekend Update on Saturday Night Live? Yeah. Like before okay. then, he had Sniglets and they were made up words, but they were very mundane. It was like, you know, words for the act of kicking your suitcase forward two steps when you're in line to check in at the airport. Interesting. You know, those those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, one of my I'm, favorite words that I don't know if it's made up or not is eldritch mm. like eldritch horrors you know like kind of that Lovecraftian like like mm. you know the, the sort of like horrific sense that you might be about to be devoured by an ancient god interesting Those yeah and it's worth things. it's worth like remember like all words are made up <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know at, at some point or another um uh, I don't know what the necessary like rubric or guidelines are for coming up with a new word, but uh, in my free time, I love taking a word and kind of breaking it apart and coming up with new ways to interpret uh, the meaning. Um, and that's basically what my Twitter is all about, just kind of mm-hmm. reframing concepts. Like if it sounds like this, it sounds like that, you know? Um, so I think that kind of having a curiosity uh, to language um, is beneficial um mm-hmm. and fun yeah and, and sanskrit the sanskrit scholars like the vowels all had their own meanings mm. and so like the words are built based on the vibratory qualities of the consonants and the vowels which is really interesting so you know they would they would even say that god is in his name so it's like if, if you're chanting to Krishna, it's like that's the vibration of God, basically, that you are filling your body and the room with. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, yeah, the, it's not a terrible thing to do, really. Yeah, the kind of uh, the God deity aspect of it reminds me like one of the definitions of uh, ineffable is like too sacred to be uttered, like, mm. like you are doing a disservice to you know the the one above or wherever who you worship by um telling anybody about how like truly special you know the the faith or the experience may be Mm -hmm. um so i think that's um yeah worth worth noting and i'm glad to be reminded of it right not to be uttered too yeah. great or extreme to be described in words. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Yeah. I just um, lost a thought. I just, I must have just had an ineffable thought because now it's gone. Oh, tragic. Well, <laughs> um, congratulations in advance when it comes back to you, whether it's during this call or otherwise. Um, yeah. I recently remembered one of my favorite children's books, which was great because I've been trying to figure out what it was for the past two years. Like that's how long it takes sometimes. Like I really, uh, do you you know the book Arrow to the Sun? Arrow, like a bow and arrow to the sun? I don't think I do. Um, Children's book, like a Pueblo Native American Mm -hmm. story. And um yeah, I want to read it to my kid, and, and it, it's taken me two years to recover <laughs> to recover the name. That happened uh, to me with uh, some show I watched or a movie as a child, and then somehow on Twitter I saw someone mention it or like someone asked the same question I had. I unfortunately don't remember off the top of my head what it was, but I made sure to you know put it on my infinite bookmarks under nostalgia uh, somewhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think um, calling that stuff in, like you know. Um, is useful or like you know even asking people like if you don't have the words like for your psychedelic experience you're like like can someone help me like figure out like the best way to frame this like here's here's kind of a brief summary like felt like i was you know one with nature and like oh my gosh yeah that's 
naturism or you know i'm not suggesting that's the actual word but like sure uh, getting community input um has been useful for me in um many aspects of life psychedelic or otherwise the phone a friend <laughs> yeah uh, it's like when you get the message, hang up the phone, but then pick it up again to call a friend if you don't know how to explain what happened. Which I, I'm not even sure we we're talking about like outdated anchors and mm -hmm. metaphors that are, you know, just because a famous person used a metaphor doesn't mean that it's right in every case. Yeah, absolutely. And similarly, like psychedelics aren't for everybody and they're not always beneficial, even though like these days you mostly hear about the benefits, though, the challenging. Well, we're, in a, we're in a bubble. Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> may I share a brief two set two sentence uh, psychedelic experience? Um, just uh, for the sake of bubble. I've been relevancy. waiting for it. I've been waiting for this this whole time. This is the point of okay. this. I, I've got I've got take, I mean, I've three. Got, um, take three sentences. Okay, we'll see. On my birthday, I was on LSD with my friends. I was blowing bubbles uh, and having a delightful time just watching them flow and bounce around. And then a new friend came in and as I blew a bubble at her, it popped and she's like, you just exploded an entire galaxy or like an entire universe. I'm like, whoa. Like, um, so uh, while the bubble did pop, it did also open my mind to you know another concept um bubbles are underrated and um just in terms of uh, further train of thought because i almost can't resist i a while ago you know early in my career i realized you could put the word psychedelic in front of everything any current business or product and eventually you know it's there's a strong likelihood it may become a reality and uh this I don't know was this conversation we talked about this on bicycle day at the yeah, like the, the product pitches and pitch stuff. Meeting. Yeah, like the like Shark Tank. Um, who's going to make the LSD microdose bubbles? That'd be one of us. We could just, you know, but because uh, they have catnip bubbles. Like I have two cats and like you can put catnip in bubbles apparently. Like mm. people talk about all the things that are now in vape pens, but like why are we putting stuff into bubbles? I, I think it sounds way more uh, fun and whimsical. Um, in a well, virtual. so it's not, there's a lot of breakage with bubbles. Yeah. Like there's a lot of spillage, like, especially if you're working with, if you're working with children, mm -hmm. like, like a two-year-old is like just as likely to just dump it out as he is to actually blow a bubble. And the bubble industry did a great job of like kind of reframing guns. Like there's bubble guns now, bubble wands, like kind of just adding more like gun, not all guns are safe, but bubble guns are safe and uh it took innovation to get there um so yeah automating the blowing process who has time to blow yeah i mean what am i some kind of savage i'm gonna blow my own bubbles yeah or even like you know they're like okay well you don't want to blow well here's a wand and you're like i i my hands are full like just give me a trigger like um yeah. And flavor bubbles, like, uh, okay, we, I feel like we're, you know, as much as I love bubbles, clearly, that's another talk. Um, I'm happy to keep going, but I also realize this is going to... Well, I'll, I'll switch to, to parking lots. You know, I've been in um, jam band parking lots, and there was a guy who was really good at bubbles for a while, mm -hmm. you know, and he had, like, the strings. Like, he was, like, doing, it was, like, a full body like art. Flow art. Yeah. Yeah. And it brings us back to music and also, you know, the visual arts, you know, it's like, like God bless those people who can encapsulate an experience who, who are able to like hold a brush. You know, there've been times when I've tried to write a sentence and through the, throwing the pen across the room and run screaming. Mm -hmm. So to have like the discipline and the fortitude to, hold a brush to paint an experience that is it's like you said so relatable mm -hmm. yeah and the the like people that can paint and describe and like put their experience there reminds me of like people trying to do it in movies like i feel like one of the most common effects in movies that are trying to depict a cycle experience is like oh well 
the walls are slightly moving or like maybe it's kind of like a double layer of the same image but like i think the mm-hmm. ones that feel like most potent and relatable are like the ones where like it's not even a visual thing it's like someone mm-hmm. walks into a room and then the audio just kind of slowly dissipates and they just like feel alone or with their thoughts and then i think um that's another example of like okay well we, we already know how to depict psychedelic visuals and movies like just make the walls move we'll be good but like mm-hmm well, there's actually more to it. Let's try something new. And then now there's a new frame of reference. And then that might inspire other people to come up with a different frame of reference. And the uh, painters um, that are doing psychedelic uh, artwork, um, you know, I love them very much. But one of the things that's most inspiring to me recently is the concept of uh, like replications. Um, I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, This is just a Reddit community where people take either like photographs or they make original videos like you know the first result here is like someone looking at their coffee or you know later on down there's like bananas breathing or here's what it looks like when I look at popcorn ceiling on LSD and um some of them are just so spot on um Mm -hmm. and showing this to somebody else like um they may be able to put words to it that like like, oh yeah like the popcorn ceiling is moving they're like that sounds weird like what do you mean it was moving like it was just like it was picked up and moved there or like it was breathing pulsating or like sacred geometry you know popping throughout um so I'm, i have a um, very strong admiration for um anybody doing this work of uh, contextualizing their experience um you know in the service of uh normalizing it um uh, getting it out there yeah there is something that's I'm, I'm i'm really enjoying these replications uh, there's something really nice as well about the inside joke like there's part of me that kind of likes getting something that other people might not get you know yeah um i was watching you know for, i was watching an interview with bill richards one time and he said something that was just like very wry you know, that was like, it was a psychedelic joke that like you, you really, you would have had to have been there. And he kind of looked and like his eyes twink, you know, his eyes twinkled. And I was like, that's, that's the, the gaze of someone who's seen some shit. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever see the movie Flirting with Disaster? No. Uh, ben Stiller is like trying to find his real, he's adopted and he's trying to find his real parents and his real parents end up like dosing the meal. Yikes. And Ben, and then ben, for some reason there's a federal agent at dinner and the federal agent gets the lion's share of the LSD. And the next day you see the, um, you know, it's this cop, this boy, you know, he's bald head. He's got like, you know, the gray, you know, trim around his uh, gray hair and he's wearing a sport coat and he's got his badge on and he's wearing no pants and he's looking very <laughs> serious. And they say, well, what happened to you? And he said, I had an experience and then it evolved and it continues to evolve for me and i thought that was freaking hell and the delivery i that was the funniest thing i that was like the best description of like somebody getting dosed like and, and and the response like it was just so spot on and i just loved it and it was just so simple and perhaps it's a little bit ineffable and if that guy went to integration circle i'm sure you'd be on able to unpack it more but i just felt like those filmmakers in those three lines just really encapsulated the experience you know yeah it gave words to other people who not necessarily were dosed without their consent which is horrible and i understand this is a fictional film but you know just even as simple as like i had an experience and like you know knowing it evolved like these are just so so like um strong in terms of anchoring it no wait is getting dosed without your consent horrible or just difficult (laughs) <laughs> well since i came up with the phrasing um, <laughs> uh, i'll say um 
it's so difficult. And one of my other, um, like, what do I need to do for this talk? I, I wrote like, um, difficult is not ineffable. Like, if you feel like it's impossible to find words, like, it's similar to like, difficult is not the same as bad. You didn't have a bad trip. Like, you know, it was definitely difficult. And like, you know, your experience is valid, but like, bad, like poor in quality, or was it like challenging or overwhelming, et cetera, like adding new words to it so that people don't perpetuate similar um, things. And I also will like openly say, I still use ineffable, perhaps, uh, you know, not necessarily irresponsibly. I don't use it for psychedelics, but I find that like some of the experiences of ineffability that I have are like gratitude mm. or uh, love and like be like, my gratitude for you is ineffable or like I, I can't put to words like um how much I love you or things like that um really so I don't think it's like a yeah I, <laughs> and uh you know I was reading a bit about like the ineffability paradox like the fact that like psychedelic experiences can be described as ineffable but like well the word ineffable means there's no description but like by using ineffable you're kind of describing it you know already um mm -hmm. and with other synonyms and things like that it's kind of um you know feels yeah paradoxical have you ever been dosed without your consent uh, i don't know i got some theories uh, but i mean <laughs> i i mean i definitely um you know i, I feel like i What's the word for when like you're getting like vicariously high? You didn't take anything like um, contact high. Yes, thank you. I feel like I got a contact high once at uh, the first uh, like bicycle day ride in San Francisco in like 2014. I don't know. Um, and there's definitely been moments where like suddenly I'm way higher and I'm like, oh well, it's probably because I smoke cannabis or because mm -hmm. my set and setting changed or something to that effect. So uh, as far as I know. No, and I've heard stories of other people who are like, oh yeah, like I really needed water. So I drank the LSD water bottle that no one labeled and fuck those guys for, you know, not for being so irresponsible and then like being the catalyst for like a horrific experience. And I'm very thankful that I have um, not had that. And when I think of um, just the concept, like, uh, like psychedelics are, are tools and like we can talk about how useful they are for positive healing effects um, as a tool but like unfortunately they can be tools for negative things as well um yeah i want to bring the whole vibe down though but yeah anyway so i took so i took lsd <laughs> <laughs> this one time at band camp <laughs> <laughs> yeah Hmm. So should we take questions? I mean, you, you do, you put a lot of, I mean, this is a great outline. This is, this is a four week class. Let's do it. Um, let's see. Let's see if I missed anything. And I'm also so delighted that like things that I did not like anticipate came up, like it's been uh, education and uh, a good thing. Um, I, I i mean one of my random notes that i don't think made it to um that line i sent as i was expanding it but just you're talking about like the secular like quotes um like from like mckenna or leary or anybody else and like those may not apply to everybody um but i think like my simple my simple note is like be the next mckenna in terms of like you know, you could have the quote that last generations, if you talk about it and like, you know, make it um, as uh, clear, digestible, um, compelling as possible. Um, and let's see what else. Um, I guess um, there was less competition back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, with people like, you know, creating a TikTok account and having like 20 million followers within a year, like um, mm -hmm. there's uh, you know, still unique opportunities. Um, yeah. to Farm so. Boy Slim. Shout out to Farm Boy Slim. I'm not familiar. 
Uh, but I'm taking the guy care of who all dresses things. up like a mushroom. He wears. He's got. You don't never see his face. He's got a big mushroom cap, and you know he's he's wears a white mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have to look into that, but it sounds appealing. Um, yeah, I I feel largely complete. Uh, I guess just to reemphasize that, like I think it's just so important that we continue speaking about it. Like it can't be the same tropes forever um and right. to overcome that uh just takes some practicing um and courage like the, we talked about briefly about coming out and like being open about your experience um and that's one way to normalize it um but i also think what you're saying like bill richards i think we still can have inside jokes and and we're mm-hmm. talking about like language and stuff i feel like it's just like a level of fluency like are you a native speaker if you're a native psychedelic speaker you'll get this joke. You'll understand um, what this means. Other people are maybe beginner intermediate and uh, may have to, you know, request more con- uh, context, you know, if granted, but. Um, I was at the doctor's office. I was getting fitted for a boot. I had surgery on my ankle and I was getting fitted for a boot and I was wearing my t-shirt that says, I believe in magic. And it had like mushrooms on it, you know? And and, and there's, you know, the, this woman who is f- fitting me for the boot, you know, this nurse assistant, she's wearing scrubs and she looks at my shirt and she goes, I like your shirt. And I looked at her and I go, do you believe in magic too? She kind of like, was like, I do. I was like, great. And that was it. That's like, that's all, you know, I don't want to blow up her spot, but like, that's, that's all we, that's all we needed to connect was you know that that level of inside joke yeah to sort of build it. the bridge of mycelial connectivity yeah there's that um i think it was leary timothy leary said like find the others but like by wearing a shirt like that you're allowing others to find you yeah uh, the others that you may be seeking like you're basically calling them in um and yeah i mean like when i think about like this day and age just like posting like an instagram story to your feed and being like like a photo of you know um the word uh integration from a 5g journey or something like that like if you know you know and like that kind of may be like oh my gosh like my friend from high school also is a psychonaut i had no idea um so i feel like there's probably more more connection opportunities uh available to all of us um if we are open about um, our experiences without being irresponsibly blatant, never break a law ever. Um, but, um, you know, in some blessed places like where I live in Santa Cruz, where psilocybin's decriminalized, like, you know, maybe you've got a friend or neighbor who uh, we can learn from each other. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, well said. And that's a, that's a good note to see if, do any of our neighbors who are here have any questions or comments? Does anybody want to jump in and share? And, um, I'd like to. Sure. Um, three things. I'll try to be quick. Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Ineffable is actually in the Amazon description of the book. So I just, I think you, you'll really enjoy it. It came to mind a lot in the conversation. Second is... Um, I signed on, um, MAPS gave permission to a couple of filmmakers to make a documentary about the FDA clinical trials for MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. I signed on as executive producer. And an interesting um, conversation with the filmmakers was like how to capture the sequences, the, the journey sequences, you know? And so do you look at animation? And if so, what kind? I mean, the, it, it's really difficult and especially in talking about destigmatizing and the, the kinds of um, projects you guys were talking about. I mean, it's super exciting to think this will be the first film done through a journalistic lens, no disrespect to, you know, veterans go to the Amazon or Goop goes to Jamaica, but it will be, they've been working on it, you know, for four or five years now. And the idea is to time it to legalization or, uh, approval, should say. But um, anyway, so things are, things are coming, not fast enough for me, but, um, um, the whole idea of I'm, I'm 60 and I feel like 
the, this is your brain on, you know, on drugs and all that. Like what I'm inspired by and hopeful about is the younger generation who didn't grow up with that. And it's a question for both of you, because um, I'm surprised at the number of younger people kind of reaching out to me to ask if I will help because I do wear pins and I do wear things around and it is like a dog whistle. And there are all kinds of ways we can invite conversation and curiosity about it. So um, there's a place called the Claremont Colleges and there are some some um, students who have started a 5C psychedelic club um, to do information and desegmentation. And they're, they're often looking for speakers. And I wondered if that would be something um, either of you or both of you would consider. It's kind of just forming and um, we're able to do it virtually, although they would also appreciate in person. But um, I'm just excited about the level of, of interest and the opportunity to disseminate harm reduction for like I had mentioned fireside in there too like that it's an opportunity to process a good experience not just to call when you're in trouble and that we have so many opportunities and you guys have been around the block you know longer than I have and so I'm trying to be helpful to them and so if if you guys or anyone else comes to mind that you think has a special soft spot for you know college age students because I saw it as like why don't we get a model for clubs around the country and just have a whole different generation coming up that we don't have the you know, the burden, they won't have the burdens that we did. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can respond. Um, and I think that the, the like MDMA FDA documentary, amazing. So glad you're working on that. And I'm reminded that like, one of the highlights of my career was traveling around the country, like filming testimonials with study participants who received like the MDMA experience and then like meeting their families and stuff like that. And being able to like share their words while they weren't necessarily describing the effects of psychedelics full. I mean, they definitely were, but the most compelling stuff was like the outcome. And I think that's another aspect of this that uh, we may not have touched upon fully where uh, if it's really challenging for you, for someone to explain their uh, subjective experience with psychedelics, like in the moment, like what was it like, what was it like after I think is just as uh, inf uh, inf informational. Um, and, uh, you know, if we find time, I've got a three minute storytelling clip that I could show that uh, kind of relates to what Dana was talking about. And, uh, with regards to the Claremont College thing, yeah, this is the start of my speaking tour. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, talk with anybody in any uh, context. And I'll put um, some contact information in the chat for anyone who wishes to follow up uh, in any capacity after. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. The tour opener. <laughs> yeah. I mean, after Joe Moore got all excited, how can you not? <laughs> yeah. yeah Dan, uh, I'm happy to help. However, I'll, t I'll talk to whoever. Cool. I really appreciate that. They're so, they're th so enthusiastic and, and on it and, and good kids. And anyway, I'm trying to be helpful to them. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. Does um, your documentary you have fun. a... Just one, one thing. I, I just want to tell Dana that, like, thank you for um, churn, letting my mind churn on, like, the best kinds of um, psychedelic animations for a documentary. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't even know if they're done. I My dad was a film and television producer, and so I'm kind of pretending I know how to be helpful and use my use of connections such as they are. So I don't really know how much you know, influence I wield. I'm just trying to be the best helper, helper I can be, but it, I'm sure they're still open because they haven't finished, you know, final edit. So if, cause that was really cool Reddit thing. I'm going to send that to, I was thinking they'll, they'll be interested in seeing that if they haven't already. So anything that kind of comes to mind and I'm sure we'll be back in touch. My, my professional title is global schmoozer. And I think I can be most helpful when the film actually needs to be seen because I'm a clinical psychologist, work in medical settings and psychedelic training. And so we need to get, get it seen in all those worlds. So for sure, you'll, you'll hear more, stay tuned. But at this juncture, if there's stuff that you think would be helpful, totally open. Cool. Is there is there a title for the documentary that's revealable yet? Um, oh, the working title is Forbidden Knowledge. Hmm. Bold move to distribute it. Uh, <laughs> the, like too sacred to be uttered, whatever. Um, definition for ineffable. Um, 
but yeah, uh, that sounds like great work. And I love your title. I love creative titles like that. Um, reminds me of like a Burning Man one where like the director of communications was like head of propaganda. Like it's fun and kind of still explains what you're doing. You know, global user. Uh, it's a great way to describe it. Other thoughts or questions from anyone? Does anyone feel like they don't know how to overcome ineffability? Because I feel like that was like the main goal. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that there's a touch point in case. Uh, I, um, I, you know, I have a problem with words in general, it seems <laughs> in my life um, and expressing myself. And sometimes um, I think it's okay also not to be able to have words and to know that that's okay as well. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's hard to, because you want to force, you want somebody, you want under, I feel like everybody wants to be understood. Right. So sometimes that's can be a challenging, but um, yeah, I think sometimes there are no words for things and that's okay. Or maybe not yet. Right. That there's still unpacking, there's still work to be done to be able to properly express whatever you experience. But I just want to thank both of you so much for your time tonight and the work that you've done and are doing. And um, it, it's, uh, I believe it, you guys are doing God's work. So thank you. I thank you for sharing. And I definitely agree that, um, you know, there, there are times where like there are no words and not to say you have to become like a painter or, you know, a film producer or anything to find the words. But um, I think, my main uh, thing is like, perhaps it's like, it's too difficult for me to describe. Maybe in the future, I'll be able to explain it better, but right now it uh, feels too difficult. But um, I guess my main goal with this whole thing is like, perhaps it's just not impossible. That just feels too binary or too stark. Like it's, it's definitely challenging and maybe like, it'll take another hundred years or whatever for Marion Webster to add like the word, you know, that, uh, you know, is most uh, connected to the experience. But I think it's totally valid. And, uh, thank you for sharing. Well, this has been really lovely. I'm glad we get to spend some time together finally. Yeah, this was fun. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you ever want to pursue it, my other two talk ideas for, you know, anytime you need to fill content or anything, um, I'd be delighted to support uh, your efforts however I can. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those other two things. I, I don't remind us what they are. Give us, you know, stay tuned think... for next time. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of them was uh, psychedelic addiction. Um, basically, talking about like how all these new psychedelic companies are coming into play. Many of them getting millions and millions of dollars of investment, getting on the stock market, and then now they're trying to grow their user base or to sell a product uh, or to get more investment. And a lot of the ads on social media right now, especially if you're in like the kind of Hey, we know you're a psychonaut targeted algorithm are just so irresponsible. And I feel like it's a disservice to the movement. I feel like there needs to be like a discussion about it. Um, and it's not like I want to blow up their spot and like report, you know, uh, irresponsible marketing copy, copy to the FDA, but like, it's also like potentially harming people that are experiencing that. Like if they see an ad on Instagram that says like psychedelic therapy, depression gone forever, it's like, how can you measure that? Or like depression gone instantly. It's like, shut up. I'm sorry for being so unfiltered, but it's just like so irresponsible and potentially putting people like in harm's way or like giving them false hope um, or like luring them into an expensive thing that like may not, I mean, will likely not produce that result. Like they, they may overcome their depression, but forever is a bit of a stretch. Instantly is a bit of a stretch especially if it's not bundled with like preparation or integration. And, um, yeah. It's just been like kind of a focal point for me where like, I just get so mad when I see some of these ads, especially after being so cautious in all of my work, like psychedelic research and the whole movement has gotten shut down before, you know, like the sixties, whatever. And like, yeah, fortunately we're in a good place now, but I operate with a level of caution to make sure that I am not culpable in any, you know, downward progression um, of the movement right now. And I feel like some of these people are kind of tiptoeing on the line of uh, what is appropriate um, and mm -hmm. potentially putting the movement in jeopardy. Uh, putting the movement, yeah. Putting people in jeopardy with substances that are potentially addictive and c can cause bladder issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
um, with while under the care of people who don't really understand the, the molecules at all because yeah they, they just try, like because, because they've tried it away. once what's yeah. that some people like you go to some some ketamine clinics or whatever it's like they give it to you and then you're just alone in a room it's like and what about you know mm. assisted care and stuff like that that's so. not the worst case scenario is being alone in the room um somebody i i came in contact with somebody who was in sort of like a group room with like you know a lot of people in, in chases and the television was on with the news playing and they were in the middle of their journey with horrible uh, like car chase death destruction <laughs> playing in the background mm. they would have rather been alone in a room <sighs> Well, I feel we like can it's, talk you know, about that. We can talk about the thought leader with no psychedelic experience whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and what was the other topic? Uh, the other topic was um, vision better than eyesight. Like, it's essentially being um, framed as. I think I said something to the effect of like, um, what you see with your eyes in a psychedelic experience is definitely a part of it. But you know, the, the broader like vision, like the, um, you know, close eye vision or the kind of manifestation, like the kind of projection image of like goals, aspiration, like, oh my God, I just had a vision for the future of my health or things like that. Just kind of talking about how eyesight, the, the things you see that are moving around or glowing, pulsating, you know, oscillating between colors is like not the extent of, um, you know, the kind of eyesight vision comparison yeah. for psychedelic experiences. Um, that was not as well formed. I'm not necessarily as passionate. I'm just like, I have here's another idea, but the. Well, see, uh, I'm passionate about that. Okay. Let's talk about it. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not saying I'm, you know, impassionate about it, but like, I think that um, the one that like really like fired me up was that addiction one. And um, I love that we've been sharing references or if you're a Seinfeld, you're already familiar with uh, Festivus. Yeah, um, like uh, there, there should be an airing of grievances for the psychedelic field <laughs> for like don't put on you know that type of thing in mm -hmm. the background while you know operating a academy clinic or uh, yeah i mean there there should be roasts on a regular basis as well i've been pitching to maps the roast of Rick doblin for a long time and i feel like the roast of anybody or the whole industry is uh well know, he's obviously thing. like the first one <laughs> you know followed by the roast let's do Boston. it <laughs> oh my gosh yeah I mean, yeah, you know, Paul great. can take it, I, I believe. They can, mm -hmm. they, you know, those guys can take it, I think. I am wearing uh, Seinfeld shirt as we oh, speak. Yeah. Yeah. So the vision thing, can I tell you what, what I hear when you say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, coaching is a lot about where, where are you, where do you want to be, and how are you going to get there? And so, and of course, there are studies that have shown that you are more likely to achieve your goals if you know what they are. Mm. Yeah, if you're just like, you know, if, if you write them down and you revisit them and you hone them and if you, if you take the ineffability out of them, if you F them, mm -hmm. then they will come. You can work towards them. And then the other thing that I think is really important about closed eye visuals it was closed eye visuals uh, because, you know, some of them are quite possibly visions of other realms and other deities and things that are not you, but a lot of it seems to be you, seems to be us. And when we're having those closed eye visuals, well, what is often happening, I, I think, is that our unconscious mind is communicating with us and trying really, really hard to be listened to, right? Like it said at the first cosm um, at, you know, Alex Gray's place in Chelsea above one of the archways, it says, love brings up anything in life like itself for the purpose of healing. Yeah. And we know that love is just, you know, it starts with an L, so it's obviously a synonym for LSD, right? So <laughs> LSD brings up anything unlike itself, which is, you know, the parts of our unconscious that are desperately trying to be seen and heard. Mm. and that's and then and then we get to integrate that so it's not just about integrating like oh i want to be a better husband it's like like i want to integrate the thing that's been living deep deep inside of me wait 
into my into the wholeness of my being mm -hmm. yeah and so many people don't even close their eyes like you know so they're uh, when they're tripping other than like you know occasional blinking um but like i feel like the method of how you got to whatever you're describing is also just important okay so like before i had this feeling of perfection i made sure to get in this stance or like you know get everything in this right place or um close my eyes um and you know do conscious breathing um and that's when it really started and i love that like that's one of the first like whenever i meet someone who's never done psychedelics or like, i'll be like close your eyes and breathe for a little bit like trust me because there's like i don't see anything moving you're like yeah i think i feel it and then they close their eyes like wow Mm -hmm. um so um i'm glad to hear your stance on it because i think that's a really great um way to frame it yeah. that i'm not considered yeah i mean i mean don't get me wrong i love a light show as much as the next guy <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm, I, I can reach for lasers with the best of them but you know uh dana did you have another is your hand raised on purpose i did mm -hmm. i just if if you were looking for topics for the future, and I don't have this one fully articulated yet because synthesis imploded relatively recently, but I went there in 2019 for training in a retreat and I, I was part of their inaugural cohort and, and uh -huh. there's a lot going wrong right now. But what's interesting to me is this um, in the chats and all the groups that I'm a part of, <sighs> pointing fingers and what went wrong and what should have been done differently and running out of financial runway. And there's all that, but emails were leaked. And a lot of us have been getting emails, but from reporters wanting people to, to, to speak to the press and there's other people's and their people are angry and resentful, understandably. And there's other people saying, look, this is what a lot of people want is for this movement to be derailed. And let's just, let's be thoughtful and let's look at who's stepping up now in a beautiful way to, I think it was epic. There's a um, psych psychedelic integration that groups that are being offered and, and um, companies that are trying to step up and um, ketamine providers and others who are trying to provide practicums. And so we just, it's always an opportunity to look at, at both sides, but I think there's just a, bigger question if we can take a, a a macro view and a longer term view and not get sucked into the urgency and the um, emotions and so I'm having trouble articulating exactly the discussion but it's like how to look at the bigger view or the, 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 the longer view and how to react and say, things are going to go sideways. What do we do when they do how to pause, how to be thoughtful, how to focus on, on the good that can come as much as the inevitable shadow and fear and bad and stuff that's going to happen. So it's all very hot and buzzy right now. Um, yeah. And I just wonder if there's a way to have a discussion about the bigger implications and the longer view, because everybody's so in the moment right now. Yeah, I do um, just, and, and this is a little bit funny. I'm being a little cheeky, but um, I told some of the people that I know from the synthesis cohort that um, we're having a, I survive synthesis discount for the TAM integration <laughs> coaching program. <laughs> That if you were part of the imploded cohort, you get 500 bucks off my training. But you know what? It's what I'm talking about. Like dial in, try to be helpful. Let's, let's, we're all in it together. We can't forget that. We can't just feed into the polarization, the divisiveness and finger, finger pointing, you know? I mean, there was a lot of good. If you talk to my cohort, we were the ones who were lucky enough to have a 10 day retreat in the Netherlands and in August and the instruction was great. The curriculum was great. Like something clearly went wrong, but let's not, let's not toss it all out. But I think it's awesome that you're, that you're doing that. Why not? Hey, just easy, real yeah. quick, I want to clarify. I laughed when you mentioned the synthesis imploding thing. It's not because I, you know, get enjoyment from people losing their livelihoods or, you know, a, a single pillar going down. But I, did, I was just reminded of the the TAM integration tweet that I put in chat about like going in on synthesis. I was like, all oh, right, like this is something I'm reminded of uh, connection with TAM integration. So um, I did not yeah. take offense. I did not take offense. I just want to, you know, since there, this may exist in perpetuity, I don't want people to think I'm maniacal. But uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm going to start a kick, uh, Kickstarter. Uh, 
Um, Bryce, thank you so much. This has been, this is a gift, your gift. Mm, thank you. You as well. It was super fun. And thank you to everybody who stayed and participated. Yeah. Thank you to everybody who watches this on YouTube in the near future. Um, super good times. Um, you know, if you, this, this is offered freely, if you care to make a donation that goes, that goes a long way. It helps a lot. Um, uh, Bryce, I've got a couple of bucks to send you. Um, and yeah, please. Uh, one thing I would like to tell you all is that we are having an event called the Mount Tam integration jam in April. If you go to integrationjam.com, you can see the lineup of folks and it's, uh, kind of our fifth year anniversary party as well, as well. And, um, yeah, just glad, just glad to be here. Glad to, uh, be able to have these conversations. As Bryce said, I love talking about psychedelics. Any um, last thoughts, Bryce? I just went to integrationjam.com and the Discord server link is invalid. That's my last thought because I really want to learn more and participate. Um, you want to moderate I, something? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I hope to be in community with you guys um, sometime soon. All right. All right, Krishna, be well. well I